Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. We'll, we, we will be live in approximately three minutes with Anna Medina. Talk to you soon. Hello to everyone who's on. I hope that you stay tuned for a few more minutes. We will be starting promptly at 12 p.m. See you soon. Just a little taste. We're going to be getting started in about one minute. We hope to see you guys soon. Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the Latino Pittsburgh Speaker Series by the Pittsburgh Metropolitan Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I'm Melanie, the director of the chamber, and I'm really happy that you're here today. Um, so for our speaker series, we actually have something a little bit different. Um, we had another speaker lined up and, you know, things happen, especially in these COVID times. Um, things don't always work out. So the first thing I thought was to go to someone whose job it is to prepare companies for failure and make sure that they can be resilient and move forward, not only at the level that they're at, but to keep moving up and just thriving. So today I'm very happy to have with me 
Anna Margarita Medina. She is a, so she has a kind of non-traditional path, I would say. She started as a small business owner and she moved into the Silicon Valley tech area. And we are so excited to have you and hear your story. How are you, Anna? I'm doing well. It's an honor to be here with y'all today. Oh. Yeah, it's it's an honor to be here with y'all today. I'm super stoked to be able to talk to y'all about my journey, but I also love that introduction. It really, we have to prepare for failure and especially in COVID times, we have to be more flexible. Like anything can happen, mental health, like keeps going up and down, especially if you're out in America. And it's just a really, really rough year. So making sure that we always have backup plans, whether it's your lunch day, your virtual speaking engagements, or your company's infrastructure, it's all really important. So important. If you can't be resilient today, you're just not going to survive. We're seeing record numbers of, numbers of unemployment, small businesses closing. So I think that connecting with you and talking about your story of resilience and how you help others achieve that is perfect for these times. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm super stoked to get connected to the Pittsburgh community. I have a few friends out there. Um, they're going to school out there. They're working in the tech space. So mega shout out to growing the tech space out there. So Anna, for some reason, you're just a little bit delayed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove you from the feed and put you back in really quick, just so that we have a little bit more lined up. And the same. All right, so let's hop right into it. Um, the speaker series, as you know, we really try to talk to people about their whole life story to see how other people can identify with that. So Anna has worked at Uber and Google and she's in Silicon Valley. So I know, especially when a lot of young Latinas look at her, um, it seems almost unattainable or perfect or like she may have had this easy life, but that is not the case. So tell us, where do you come from? Where did you grow up? <clears throat> I was born and raised in Costa Rica. My parents are Nicaraguan, so I do carry the Costa Rican and Nicaraguan flag with a lot of pride. I love being Nicaragüense and Costa Ricense. So mega shout out to all my Central Americans who are watching to us today. And we moved to the United States when I was 10 years old. We decided to settle in Miami because we had family there. And that's kind of when I started getting into technology. I started coding and this is how I launched my small business. I decided to become a freelance graphic designer, web designer, photographer, motion graphic, all these creative things that I kind of had a little bit of creativity in. And I also had the experience in the technology field and that later transition to more opportunities and more jobs. And it's been lots of ups and downs and I'm excited to, to be able to talk to y'all all about it. you're on mute. <laughs> that, that happens, right? <laughs> I love it. Um, well, tell me a little bit about when you were growing up um, and you were very young, did you have any idea that you wanted to come into this space? I had no idea. It's, it's funny because I actually wanted to be a firefighter. I would watch all these 9-11 shows and like helping people and like emergencies. And I thought that was pretty neat, but I'm afraid of fire. I started like using lighters only like three or four years ago. I couldn't even light my own candles. I would always be asking my friends to help me. So when I was growing up, I think around not like 10 or 11, I wanted to become an architect instead. And I realized that I do not know how to draw. And all of a sudden that started crumbling down. So I started to realize that I like technology. I started coding and I, I was good at it. I started making money off it and I still wanted to go to school for architecture. And that's when I started like talking to like friends around me, my dad. And it was just like, you know, maybe architecture is not really your thing. Think outside the box. So I did a few internships out in Miami, Florida at a credit union in software development. And that's when people were telling me, hey, Anna, you're too much of an extrovert. You're too pretty to be an engineer. Like, don't don't follow your passion for coding. And a cubicle life is not for you, is what a lot of folks told me. I took these internships. I went into the cubicle working at a credit union nine to five. I met some amazing people and I realized you can still stay extroverted. You can still stay Latina and pretty and be your own person in this tech space. And that's when I was like, you know what? 
this job is pretty cool. What do I need to study in order to get here? So the girls that I was working with, it was amazing to work with other Latinas at such a young age. They were like, hey, Anna, you should consider computer science and computer engineering. So that in high school, like that, I was in high school at that moment and I started realizing, okay, I can apply to computer science programs. And I decided to go to a community college out in Miami, Florida to pursue that and later transferred to University of California in Santa Cruz. And when I was out here in Santa Cruz already, I had already gotten full-time offers to be a software engineer, but I come from a Hispanic home. One of the things that our parents always tell us is, go get that paper degree, make us proud, is the American dream. I was really depressed in school. I didn't realize I was depressed. I had no understanding of depression, mental health. I just knew that I was miserable and something kind of needed to change. So that's kind of when I decided to, to talk to my family, like I need to drop out of school and dropping out of school allowed for me to go straight into Uber and start working in software engineering. So things kind of worked out in my favor, but it was kind of like a really, really bumpy ride that I never thought I would kind of get into tech at all. So whenever you were talking about way back in the beginning of the story, you just glossed over that. You were like, yeah, and I just started coding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and the thing that is, it was exactly just like that, though. So I in middle school in Miami, you take uh, elective classes. And I went to a middle school that allowed for us to take introduction to computers introductions to computers at this moment it was a class that they teach you microsoft word excel and powerpoint but i had an amazing teacher that also taught me a tool called microsoft publisher this tool is like not really that common now but it was it was used to make like print collages websites so being the little curious latina girl that i was in class we're working on things and there's a little button that says insert html and I was just like, okay, what does this do? You click it and a little white box opens up where you would put code in. And at that time, Google wasn't the search engine that people were using, or I, at least in my home, we use Alta Vista. So I went on Alta Vista and I was like, what is HTML? And it's like hypertext markup language. And it's like, this is how you make websites. And then you use cascading style sheets. And then you use JavaScript and putting these three, three uh, languages together in a way you form websites. And around this time, I don't know who's watching age and things like that, but MySpace was around. And MySpace was the social network that came before Facebook that allowed for you to customize your profile. So in the, in the coding space, you can use HTML and CSS and MySpace to make your layout super pretty, put glitter all around it, hide your music player. So I was in sixth, seventh grade learning how to do these things. And then I went on MySpace and I sold layouts and it was like, oh, cool, coding is, is really neat. And I just found this passion and I started just searching more online, like how do I put an image for it to bounce around? How do I make my text pink? How do I put a banana that like rotates in my cursor? So like my curiosity and like need for creativity really allowed for me to just kind of let coding happen. And it was very much of starting to code at 13 years old, not knowing that down the line, this would be my career. Okay, so I think it is significant to say that MySpace changed your life, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's not that you cut, like we say it that way, there is a part where MySpace changed my life and then later down the line, Twitter ends up being another uh, opportunity that completely changes my life drastically. So I guess I'm, I'm just that one of those like millennial kids that grew up on the internet. <laughs> that social media. This is that. <laughs> Well, I want to come back a little bit because we'll get to that. Um, so you grew up in Costa Rica, right? What did your parents do? So my mom was a stay at home mom. She was wanting to become a psychologist, but things in Nicaragua were really rough. So she wasn't able to finish her education. My dad was an entrepreneur. So that my entrepreneur side of me totally comes from my dad, which I totally love. And he had very small businesses in Nicaragua uh, up until his death. So from creating plastic uh, things for, for shops, uh, one fourth ownership of a soda company to having like real estate that he would rent out. He was always looking for ways that he can use his worth to create more of a capital gains. And he was also really big and always giving back to the community. So we grew up in like, a low-income middle-class home and in Nicaragua 
majority of the folks there are either on the really, really high end of, of high income homes or low income. So the discrepancy of, of just wage and like class and living is really drastic. So he was always giving back to the community. And it's something I always admired of him because it always made me realize, okay, you can always do all these cool stuff of launching your own things, being your own boss, but you should never forget where you actually came from and realizing that your community, your roots are always going to want your advice. So tell me how uh, Latino culture shaped who you are as a young child at that point before you got, you know, out into the real world. <laughs> so it, it shaped me in the sense of like family, like comes first. Like that's always been something that was rooted. Uh, later down my line, I learned that life is really rough. And unless you really try hard to make family and friends a priority, work is going to take over. It's just part of that American dream mentality, which I have a lot of struggles with. And part of it was love. Love and community are two things that Latinos have that a lot of older cultures don't really embrace as much as we do. We're loving, we're touching. We have different we, we come from different places, but we all are brought together by sharing the same language on our love for certain types of food, like platanos, frijoles, arroz, like habichuelas. Like I know everyone calls them different, but there's certain things that like we can always relate to from like croquetas, empanadas, pastelitos. And I think being able to all come together and these little, these little things that only us know that we've been exposed to our entire childhood and like they're really instilled in our values is really awesome and community is one of those other things that like being latina is is something amazing because we're all about always uh, embracing anything that life throws at us but we also understand that we need each other in order to one build each other up empower one another be there through the rough times but just to come together and do something better than the prior generation. So that's something that, as I said, my dad instilled in me early, where it's like, you always give back to your community. And my mom coming from a conservative home, uh, Catholicism, we were always like, you gotta give back to the less fortunate. You never can forget where you came from. So always trying to make events happen in Latin America is something that I'm always passionate about. And it's like, those things is like, I. I love being me. Like I tried to stop being me in order to fit into Silicon Valley. And we learned that that's not a good idea. So now I totally embrace who I am. And I try to be as loud as I was born in Miami of just being the partiness, the loud music, the reggaeton, the salsa, the bachata, to my love for, for food and just embracing community and always giving back. You know, someone asked me the other day um, about the stereotype of Latinas. They were like, I feel like Latinas, the stereotype is that you're all so fun and powerful and strong. And I was like, we are. <laughs> is that a stereotype? I, I don't know. You know, everyone's different. But, you know, I think I think we might fit it a little bit. <laughs> yes. And it's interesting because like that stereotype. You at least in Miami, like Miami is Latinos everywhere. The amount of like non Latinos that I met was very, very small. So it was a little bit of a culture shock when I came out to California where Latinos are not as common. And then it's like the Latinos that we have here is not the same cultures of the Caribbean and the, the, the more diverse Central Americans and like South Americans. So they're all out here, there's just a lot less of them. And that to me was like a shock. And then the stereotypes kind of came into play in Silicon Valley where it was like the stereotype of the Latina is being pretty feisty, very sexualized and just always like ambitious. And then that kind of like gets taken into harassment and to other things that really make you uncomfortable. And that's kind of when I shut my Latina side out and I was like, no, I'm not going to be wearing makeup. I'm not going to be well-dressed because that's going to cause more harm to my career and make me uncomfortable. And then like other things happen. And like now, like two, three years ago, I was like, no, I'm going to embrace my fullness and bring my whole self everywhere I go. So other Latinas can realize that there are ways that they can just be as loud, wear their amazing lipsticks, their gold hoops, their like nail extensions, eyelash extensions, whatever extra nest that Latinas want to bring into Silicon Valley, bring it. 
Yes, absolutely. Bring it. Be yourself. Um, and that that actually brings me exactly to what I wanted to ask you next. So you are outgoing, well-spoken, brilliant, of course. Did you always have this confidence? And specifically, I want to know when you moved from Costa Rica to the United States, how was that? Did that change you at all? Because that seems to be a trend that we see in these interviews is when people went from one culture to the next, that it kind of changed who they are. Do you see that at all in yourself? So I think the move from uh, Costa Rica to United States was different and weird for me. We had gotten the chance to get residency in the United States. It's a process that my parents have been going through for countless of years. So basically we land in the United States and they tell us, you either take your residency or you lose it. We had no plans of moving to the United States. Like, yes, paperwork was in place, but my brother and I were going to school. So we got basically removed from Costa Rica, dropped into the United States. We had family here, thankfully, but I lost all my friends. We didn't have social networks to stay in touch. And that kind of ends up being trauma that I end up realizing like years later through therapy that I still have to deal with. And if anything, the one thing that I think it really allowed for me to like learn at a young age is mobility, not being tied to a place, not being tied to friends and just being able to pack up and go. So it has pros and cons of, of the trauma. And like, I think you can always look in silver linings and situations. And with that is like, I, I was able to be in Miami, going to school here. I packed up and I went to Detroit for four months to do an internship. And I, and I, I was, I got homesick, of course, but I think it wasn't as hard as many of the kids that I knew at my age that were doing things like that. I went back to Miami. I packed my bags, went to California. I packed my bags. I went to Nicaragua. And I don't think people my age have a little bit of easiness in doing situ of embracing situations like that. And that's something that I feel like that big culture shock did for me of just like, you can't be tied to anything. You are a free spirit in this world. And life is kind of like what you make out of it. That is so amazing. And I think that recognizing sometimes that maybe we don't have it as easy as others is really important and just appreciating everything that we have. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, we went through college really quickly. You said that your family always encouraged you to go to school. Um, those of you watching know I've said this a few times. It's something that it's negative, but I like to bring it up. Um, Latinos are the least likely to seek higher education of any group. And I like to bring that up because we need to change it. Um, so tell us a little bit about how your family encouraged you and what that meant to you and then your your journey, what you went to school for and why you chose that. Yes. So my dad had done schooling in Nicaragua, in Costa Rica. Um, I believe he has a he got a bachelor's in something. I don't I think it was business administration. But later down the line, like I think up until his death, he actually went and tried to become a lawyer in, in Nicaragua. So after he passes away, we actually get his degree of becoming like a certified lawyer. So he always had this always continual learning, but not necessarily for the degree, but more for personal uh, learning and giving back to the community, empowering others. My mom always had this dream of finishing up her psychology degree. And that's like something that we know that like she has, but it wasn't that she tried to instill in me, like you need to go get your degree. My brother, like when we moved to the United States, my brother at that time was, I mean, he's always 10 years older than me and he was finishing his high school. A big reason why we decided to settle in the United States, it was that American dream. And it was very much of like, they wanted my brother to finish his last year of high school in the United States in order for him to have easier access to community colleges and universities in the United States that Central American does not have the same ability to provide. And he had a, an amazing brain, like his, his uh, strengths are engineering, science and math. They knew the schools were in the United States. So seeing my brother get pushed to school was something I saw my entire like childhood. And I do think that definitely comes in play. He decided to study electrical engineering. So his, as he's in his first two, three years of schooling, he'll come home and bring his electrical engineering projects. And 
he would be like this is how you do binary i was just like 13 or 14 like i was starting to get into coding but i didn't understand how all the computer pieces came together so my brother definitely helped put that put that in and he would show me motherboards he would go do competitions in university and i had a lot of cousins like Latino families were huge, but I had a lot of cousins that were in Miami and in other portions of the United States, and they were all pursuing uh, undergraduate degrees or master's degree. And it was just kind of like a no brainer, like, Anna, you're, you're smart, your family goes to college. And when those conversations started happening for me, I got those conversations at a young age in like eighth grade, where it was like, all right, Anna, you're going to go to high school, you're going to go to high then you're going to go to a college and you'll have a career. My mom would always say like, you should always get a master's degree. And when I got to the moment of transitioning to high school, Miami offers uh, different opportunities in, in Miami. I decided to go to a magnet school that is specialized in certain uh, verticals. So I chose the information technology uh, with a specialization in web design and graphic design through the national Academy foundation. It's actually an organization that now I sit on the board for, for the alumni. But in high school at that moment, I knew that I had the passion for computer science and I know I was good at it, which is, is not common to have both, I think, or realize that. So I decided to finish high school in three years so that I can get to college faster. And when we were looking at colleges, I was involved in a lot of leadership groups in high school, a lot of community service. So I had one of those resumes that people would just like look over and it's like, how do you do so much? And it's like, well, I was a high school student that was really ambitious and doing 60, 70 hours worth of work every single day. I mean, not a day, whoa, that's bad math, but every single week. And uh, then uh, scholarship opportunities arose through all the organizations that I was part of. So I learned that I can get my school paid for. And I had gotten a full ride opportunity to go to Mount Holyoke College out in Massachusetts. They flew me out to visit the school on a computer science type of uh, scholarship for four years. And I was like, this is awesome. I get to go to a well-known university out of state that is going to be paid for. But when I went out to visit, I sat in on their data structures class and I just didn't feel it. Like I wasn't able to feel like I could be a student in that lecture hall. It was a little bit of I'm more of a self-paced learner and this small environment just didn't like fit with me. So I went back to Miami, like this is still my, my senior year of high school. And I started applying to more schools. And one of the things that I did is that I took, uh, I applied to my community college. So I knew I was going to get into a community college, but my community college is Miami Dade College. One, I think it's the largest community college in the United States. They also offer an honors college program. So you need to have like a 3.7 GPA, letters of recommendation, go through interviews. But they do this two year program where they're paying for your schooling, giving you a stipend to pay for your books. And I had other scholarships that I had gotten for being like a, a woman in tech pursuing a computer science degree. So I was actually getting paid to go to school. And that was really enticing for me, considering that my family was like struggling financially. And this was one way that I could buy my own technology devices and continue my passion. And that's when I was like, all right, school's really awesome. I did my two years of community college, but we knew that we wanted to come to Silicon Valley. So I decided to transfer to University of California, Santa Cruz. And my plan was to finish up my degree, go to finish my computer science degree, transition to working to a top four technology company. At that time, I was already working with Google. So being in Silicon Valley was literally easy and my dream. But things kind of didn't pan out. I do think that Latinos need to go to college and I'm a huge advocate for community college. I do think that everyone learns different. And for me, a school setting wasn't good enough for me. I'm self-motivated and no external factor can motivate me. I need to motivate myself. And at that moment, that school wasn't it. So I always kind of like talk to my mom and she's like, oh, when are you going to go back and finish your degree? And I'm like, mom, sorry to break it to you, but maybe not. And now I always have this idea that if I do go back to school, I would try to get exempted of my undergraduate degree based on experience and pursue an MBA. So I, I think there's still plans for me to get some form of degree in the near future. <laughs> I love your path. Um, and those of you who are tuned in a little bit late didn't hear kind of where you started. So you've always been someone who 
you know, where there's a need, you fill it, where there's a desire, you, you know, go after it until you get it. And it's so funny about the degree, because I think that the general population thinks when you drop out of college, it's this horrible thing. But I think when you're in tech, and when you're in a space with founders, it's so different. Like we always joke that for a founder, if you didn't go to college, it's a point against you. But if you dropped out, it's a point added. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I want to start with, you know, your first first job came out of kind of a necessity. And that's something that I think, you know, most people start a business later in life and coming out of corporate. I want to hear about the need that you had and why you had to start your own business at such a young age. Yes. So definitely entrepreneur mindset from a young age. My dad gave me the like one of those get rich books of like poor dad. I, I didn't read it, as you can tell. But he was always like, if you read one book, it needs to be this. And he's like, the only way that you can be successful in life is to be your own boss. This is the advice I was getting as a 13 year old, 12 year old. So when I find technology at 13 and I start coding, a year or two later, that's when I start doing MySpace profiles for people. And then people start contacting me about needing a website made. Like the World Wide Web is becoming more prominent. People want small businesses on there. And that's when like the opportunity started happening where they're like, hey, Anna, can you do this favor for me? So I was like, OK, you need photography. You need graphic design. You need web design. I think I just launched my own freelance business. So things kind of happened organically. And it was very much of, I didn't know how to price anything. I was trying to like look online of like, what do you tell someone to pay you for a website in 2010? And I, I had no idea. I like, I had no friends in this space that I could actually relay on. So I would kind of just give my own prices. People would pay me. And I was also heavily involved in the church. So through the church, it would like word of mouth. People would be like, oh, Anna does photography. And I would go volunteer and like, shoot photos at a concert and then I'll go like edit them. And then I would, I got a, a, an opportunity to do a promotional motion graphics video for another church conference happening in California. And like, it was just networking without the social media aspect of it, where people were just kind of letting people know of like, I know this young girl in Miami who has a freelance business, but a lot of my reason for doing this is that at that moment, my parents were going through like a tough financial moment. And I knew that I wanted to apply to go to college. I knew that I wanted a computer. I knew that I wanted video games. And my parents were struggling to find the money to for us to have food daily. So that's kind of where it kind of all started fitting in of like, wait, I have skills that I can provide for people where they pay me. And then I take that money. I get to help my family here and there. And then I get to save money and buy a computer and I get to apply to Stanford, Georgia Tech, any school that I want to. Like it felt no brainer for me at a at a 15 year old, 14 year old. I, I love that where there are difficulties, you find a way to make it work. You find a way to make it happen. And that that comes from, you know, being Latina and, you know, what your your um, family was going through. I think that a lot of times when we talk about underestimated, underserved, disadvantaged, um, we say that that's a bad thing, right? It's almost, you know, when you talk about I'm, I'm going to serve this population with my company, I've literally had people ask me, Oh, is that a 501c3? Um, no, elevating Latinas, minorities, like this is not charity. We're we're giving people the platform that they deserve, right? So in that space, it seems like all of your disadvantages you've really used as advantages to catapult you forward. But bringing you up to that point where you're in Silicon Valley, you know, all the time we hear about the struggles of women and Latinas. I mean. We see it every day, but when we hear about Silicon Valley, it seems to be really magnified. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, yes, definitely. I I knew that when I was looking at getting into technology, I did my research, the numbers were that 17% of computer science degrees were going to women. And then when it came to actually women in the work field, it was only like five to 8% of women were in the technology field. But when you look then later at like black and Latinx people in tech companies, it was looking more like one to 2%. So as I'm writing my college entrance essays, I was like, 
the numbers are really bad. I have a passion to make a difference. And it's actually really weird to go back and read my college essays and see that I had this passion for, for bringing more underrepresented talent into the space when it's become a huge thing that all of us are doing now. It's amazing. And on that note, it was just like, I, I felt that is what I needed to do. And I knew that tech was rough. Like we heard that there was a lot of men and I knew that like sexual harassment would happen, but I didn't learn, I didn't realize that it was going to start happening to me at such a young age. Like since I was like a high school senior, I was already getting involved in tech conferences. And then men would just assume that I'm at tech conference for like sexual things of like wanting to meet people and partners and not really value me as an engineer. Like I wouldn't get talked to if I, as if I was a founder, like entrepreneur, engineer, they would just think that like you're HR, you're recruiting, you're just a pretty girl at this conference. And kind of like the same thing would happen in social media when I would talk about technology, it would just be like, no, like she's not an engineer. And that later got more magnified with other social media networks kind of happening and I would take photos at tech conferences like with really, really well-known developers in, in like Google, Facebook space. And they would be like, oh, like they would make sexual comments about me. And it was really, really weird. So I decided to take a story with Bloomberg, I think in 2013, where I talk about where my entire culture tells me to shut up about these things that happened to me. And at that moment, I felt that I couldn't like I was at a big cloud conference and this was happening and I had proof on social media and all this. So that's kind of where I was like, no, I need to be upfront about the sexual harassment that happens because it's not cool. And I did that for a few years, but then I ended up at Uber and Uber had a really toxic culture in, in the organization that I was part of. And there was a lot of sexual harassment, discrimination, advances done at happy hours and kind of just all sorts of things that I didn't know how to navigate. But in that moment, I kind of shut that part of my brain that told me like, this is not good. Like you shouldn't like be around these people. It just felt like I need this for my career and I can't say anything. I need to stay silent about a lot of stuff. And things got really, really bad that led for me to like end up like burning out. I had taken up diversity and inclusion issues with the CTO and the CEO of Uber and nothing was getting done. So that's kind of when things started crumbling down. I ended up like in a really depressive episode, hospitalized, burnt out. I lost 35 pounds. And all of it was based on the fact that I was working like 50 hours a week, trying to do engineering work, trying to do diversity and inclusion and maintain a happy face while, while everything was going on. So after I get hospitalized, I end up talking to lawyers and stuff and we end up realizing how bad everything was going. So very similar to what I've shared, where it's like I look for silver lining in situations and a lot of girlfriends of mine were going through really rough situations at Uber. So we put together a class action lawsuit that ended up covering a class of 488 engineers that were either woman engineers, Latinx, um, Native American or black. And it was based around the fact that uh, we weren't getting paid the same as our equals who happened to be white males. So an entire class action lawsuit based on hostile work environment and equal pay discrimination. And that was like the last straw for me where it was like, we tried to go up to upper leadership. The media knows about this. I'm not gonna share everything on the media cause I care about my career. And then I have my network of friends telling me like, Anna, don't do a lawsuit. You wanna have your own startup later down the line. The same investors that are investing in Uber won't invest in you later. And I talked to a girlfriend of mine and she's like, Anna, if someone is going to judge you for bringing a class action lawsuit based on sexual harassment, hostile work environment and discrimination, don't take their money down the line. And I was like, you're amazing, Carla. Like, yes, I will, I will follow what I know is right in this culture. And that was where I was like, we're never going back to that naive Anna that was okay with letting things happen because this was a big tech job and you needed to stay quiet. Yes, we need so much more of that in the world, right? I mean, when we keep letting things go and go and go and we don't fight back, that's what perpetuates it. So 
whenever you were going through that, what were things like at work and how did you overcome that? It was rough. Um, there was a lot of substance abuse that was going on at the organization. So definitely suppressing emotions and like just enabling one another in order to stay happy on the job and working crazy hours in order to meet all the demands of the organization. And I thankfully had like my best friend that was going through all of this with me. Uh, she was a person that had referred me into Uber. So she had been working there like almost two years prior to me joining. So she had gotten a lot of the same stuff that I had been going through, but for much longer. So because we had each other, I think we made it out. I think if we wouldn't have had each other, things could have panned out very, very differently, like in a war situation. And I also like had good, good network of Latinos, like going back to my community. Um, I am involved in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area with a lot of nonprofits and organizations. And it's like my Twitter fam, my my Code 2040 family and like all the, the people there where I would tweet that I was going through stuff, whether, whether whether it was like a crying emoji or a shrug emoji or actually talking a little bit more about it. And then the media was all over Uber going through like hostile work environment in, on, in 2017. So friends would like reach out to me and like they knew I couldn't say much because it was a really public thing going on. But the friends that I did have in my close circle that I was really candid with the situation, like they would check in on me, they would try to make sure I was fine. And then when things got really bad, like with my best friend, like I checked myself into the hospital, I was like highly suicidal and like high risk and things were rough. But if it wasn't for having my community there to hold me up through the roughest, like four, six months, like, I don't know, like every, uh, that, all that timeline is completely a blur. Um, and that's things that I value with community. Like I will share my wins. I will share my failures because it's not fair when we look at the American dream and everything looks like a white picket fence and pretty and that you're going to eventually get a lot of money working in America. Like, no, that's not really what usually happens. And I felt that those stories were not shared as, as often. Uh, that was one of my future questions was what's the importance of sharing your story but i want to thank you so much for sharing it that with us i think that like i said before when people see where you are they think that it was just this easy breezy thing um and i want to talk about people who are going through that right now um you know we may have people watching or people may watch this later who have gone through or going through something similar but they don't have that same support system. They don't have that same, um, you know, bigger, wider view that you all have had in your mind for so many years. What would you say to them to help them pick themselves back up and just be hopeful for the future that it will get better? Yeah, it's it's definitely rough when you can't see the end of the tunnel whatsoever, where you think that the harassment won't stop, that your workplace won't get better. I think you got to check in with yourself and first find out how burnt out you are, whether you actually want to stay in the job, whether you have enough bandwidth to make a difference and enough of a leadership position to make a difference. I think that was a key element that I didn't identify at a young age. And it's, it's very much about you have to do what's best for you. Like you only have one life and a job is a job. So if you need to look for another job, that's something that that is totally reasonable. Like it, it's 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 2020. You should be more comfortable leaving a job because they're racist or like hostile work environment. They're not taking into account the factors that you have going on in your life during COVID situation. And if if it's hard to find the job, because I think that was one of the things that was the struggle for me. It was I was burnt out. I was going through mental health stuff that I didn't even know was mental health related. And I wanted to leave Uber, but how do I go do all my engineering practice interviews and prep for it when I have no bandwidth to like have a life. So I had to go on medical leave. Like my check-in with myself was very much of like, I'm in a really bad shape. I need hospitalization help and like a bigger health team to be around me while I'm going through all of this. And I took a medical leave of absence from Uber. And that's kind of like how I was able to finally have enough time to go find a lawyer to talk about my options. So 
it's also about knowing your legal rights in your state and in the United States or whatever country you're in, being able to know what is actually right in the workplace. So there's a few stuff that I'm putting together with a, a few friends in the upcoming months that are going to be around resources of what do you do? How do you identify microaggressions, harassment, realizing that you need to document all of that but also what is life after you do a public facing lawsuit against a tech company um, from like making sure you're rotating all your passwords because there's hackers in the internet and your face and name is getting smeared to how do you build yourself back up to feel like you're worthy of belonging in tech. And I think that's the thing is like, we think that after things like this happen, we need to leave tech. I was ready for that to be my last tech experience. And I, I call, I was at the Uber headquarters, like just crying my eyes out outside. And I called my mom and I'm like, mom, this is my last tech job. Like I'm really cross-functional. I can do so many other things. I'm going into marketing in a non-tech company. And that my mom was just like, what are you, what are you doing? Like you're great at this. But that was my my thing. I was going to run away from tech because everything that it brought around me hurt me, whether it was the substance abuse, the sexual harassment, the memories of like San Francisco venture capitalists and all this. And I was going to run away. But no, like you need to understand that you belong here. And it's based on the part that you're you as an individual bring so much to the table. And if you're Hispanic and Latino, we definitely need more of you in any type of space because we are becoming one of the, the populations that's going to be more represented. And like we see that so many of us can now vote that we weren't able to vote last election. And when we start seeing number changes like this, that's when we start realizing that all together we can come in and actually make a difference. So I think if you're going through it, it's just kind of like hold strong. Try to find someone to talk to, whether it's a community, friends, support groups, therapists, hospitalization, like don't go through it alone because so many other people have gone through this. And yes, it was really rough for me. I am still here. Other women and minorities had gone through things before me in order for me to have an easier path in seeking legal uh, lawsuit with Uber. So I would say this just like, hold, hold on and remember that you belong in tech you belong in whatever industry you're in and you belong in this world like your life is is worth living and you just have to find your own happiness And on, on that note, I will add that if anyone is like going through anything, you can always like reach out and I'm happy to to okay. pair you up with some resources, whether it's legal resources, uh, blog posts about other minorities going through similar situations okay. and how they overcame it. And it, I think it goes back to that. Look for the silver lining in your situation to make it better for the next generation. And sharing your story is part of it. Thank you. I you just carried it on. I actually dropped out for a minute, so thank you for staying in. <laughs> um, yeah, your your story is tremendous. Um, and not only the fact that you you went through all of these things, but that you stood up for what was right and you came out on the other side for the better and you're still moving forward. I love that you were able to accept that you would be out of the thing that you love to do the right thing. You know, even this is some though this is something we talked about before, you know, I kind of teared up because that takes such immeasurable yeah, I'm going to cry. It's such a measurable strength and that that's exactly what we need in the world and I hope that everyone watching knows you don't need to be afraid to stand up for what's right because you're making the world a better place for you, for me, for our future children and for all future generations. So thank you so much for what you're doing for women, for, for everyone. No, oh, thanks. Yeah. And I, I teared up thinking about everything too. So I, I, it, it's, it's a touchy story, but it's like, if we don't have this, the spaces to share the stories, we never learn. And I got lucky that I was able to find uh, a space where I belonged again and, through networking and like my mentorships that I usually had in Silicon Valley, I was able to go back to a passion project in in in, in the engineering industry of chaos engineering. And that's kind of where like the whole failure and reliability uh, kind of comes in into my life where it's like, we do have to learn how to embrace things and 
whether it's on a personal level, on a community level, or making sure that our systems, infrastructure, and applications are always up and running. And as, as I mentioned, I was about to leave my software engineering cushiony life to look for something that was less toxic for me. And that's when uh, I had a, a woman in tech in the industry that I knew that was doing the same type of engineering that I had done at Uber. And a company was getting created around this space. And that space is chaos engineering. So I work at Gremlin, which I didn't get to share a little too much on, but we're a SaaS company that offers a chaos engineering platform. What that means is that we inject failure into systems and applications in order to make them more reliable. So trying to think of what happens if you lose your data center, what happens if your website loses connection to your Stripe API and all these things that, that kind of make your business run and make your customers happy when your applications are not working, you lose business. And now, especially in COVID, we see that our health, our businesses, our transportation, our health, like I think health is the most important one, of course, right now, like are relying on technology and technology is going to break. So we need to make sure to prepare for those failures in so many different levels of, of it, from practicing what your engineers need to do to bring systems back up, making sure that you have everything documented and that you have prepared for, for natural disasters and such. So I love what you're doing because that's what you're doing today. You know, we had a little mini crisis and you swooped in and saved it. And I'm, I'm so glad that you did. These are all topics that we need to be hearing more about. But I want to talk first about how you heard about this role, how you got into this role, because I think that one thing that I can really see is that social media has kind of played a role so much. Like, I mean, you started with MySpace, right? And I want everyone to hear the rest of your story and how you've been able to use technology tools to really enrich and shape your life. Yes. So MySpace taught me a lot of my, my my starting ground into a coding space and technology. But then I mentioned my best friend of, of, of Uber, um, Ingrid, and her, I met her through Twitter. So I was in Miami. The Miami tech scene was relatively, really small. And I wanted to go out to Silicon Valley. So little old me was very much of like, what tools do I have right now that allow for me to meet people in California that are working at Google, Tesla, Facebook, all these things. And I started looking for Latina engineers in Silicon Valley to Twitter and I found Ingrid. And Ingrid at that time was working at Intel. So I remember reaching out to her and I was like, whoa, you love art, I love art too. You do engineering, I do engineering. You're a Latina, I'm a Latina too. Like let's become friends. And we became friends. And she referred me into Uber and we got a chance to work together. and that was like if it wasn't for her i wouldn't have gotten the foot in the door at uber i would say so being able to use my social network that i was building in twitter for being like a funny tech person i i don't even know i think i was tweeting about php and dreamweaver so i don't know what credibility i had in the space but because of her like uber was a big portion of my engineering career and like if it wasn't for twitter it wouldn't have happened and then my current job I actually met my manager through Facebook when I moved to San Francisco. I was like, I'm moving to San Francisco. There's this woman in tech event that I wanna go to at the Twitch office, who wants to come with me? This is my second week in California. And she reached out, she's like, yeah, Anna, I'll go with you. We met up at this event and she's like, what do you do? And I was like, I'm doing chaos engineering at Uber. It's like this, this, this small project that got built out a few years ago from Netflix and stuff. And I'm like, what do you do? She's like, I do chaos engineering at Dropbox. And I was like, but only Netflix does chaos engineering. Like, what do you mean? And she's like, no, there's a few companies like that are starting to do this upcoming industry called chaos engineering. And for the later two years, she tried recruiting me into her team and I kept her as a mentor. And as everything with Uber kind of crumbled, she was like, Anna, like, are you looking for a job? Gremlin is hiring. We need someone to come like be cross-functional, do public speaking, help our customers build how to get started in chaos engineering to make sure that your companies have less incidents. And I was like, I'm not qualified to do that whatsoever. You need to have like 25 years of technology experience. She's like, but you have done this before. Like, what do you, why are you having imposter syndrome in this moment? And I kind of just embraced it. I signed on and 
my first week at the company, I was on a flight to Singapore to present at this technology conference in chaos engineering. And it was really cool that it was very much of like, I was really shy. I wasn't someone that did public speaking. I had did, done a few public speaking gigs around diversity in tech, what it's like to give back to the, like the Latinx community and such, but I've never stood in front of a room full of engineers that have been in the industry for 20, 30 years. And I telling them, how do you make your systems better? How do you make sure to prepare for those failures? And that was something that was like pretty life changing for me. And like now I've been at Gremlin for two and a half years. Our com com customer base has grown a lot. And I, I feel like I've grown more as an engineer. I've grown more as a person. I've made amazing friendships. And it all kind of came through this Facebook connection of I was about to leave tech. Like if it wasn't for her hitting me up and me respecting her as a, as a woman in tech in the field, I was on my way out. Wow, that that's really amazing. And I love how you talk about like connecting with other women and connecting with other Latinas, because I think that's something that you do really well. Um, so the question that I have for you is, what advice do you have for Latinas and Latinos who are looking to break into the Silicon Valley tech space? Yeah, so I would say use any social media to your advantage. I think that now we have various avenues that you can get into Silicon Valley, which were not available a few years ago for me. So I would say that Twitter is an amazing starting ground. It's a great way for you to like just start finding some people to follow that are in the in a company that you want to join or that post about something that you identify with. And then just start having conversations with them post some content around the industry and like things that you're passionate about. And with that also comes like LinkedIn is another great one. Um, we also like Mel and I were talking earlier, there's a, there's a invite only type of uh, social network going on called clubhouse. That's another great opportunity to start meeting people. And I think that this current time and like anyone that's trying to break into a field, like y'all have an advantage where everything is virtual. It doesn't matter where you're based out of, Yes, it still really matters who you know, but you get to know the right people because everything is virtual. Everyone is putting themselves out there virtually more than they were eight months ago. So use that COVID like little small thing that we have to deal with as your advantage. And there's a few other organizations that are trying to bridge that gap between Silicon Valley, between tech and Latinos. Um, so definitely it's like, I, I do a lot of work with Tecnolochicas, but that that is like trying to just bring more latinas into stem for those that i think are trying to get into silicon valley tech um there's an entire slack community well like it's more than slack called tequeria uh they're just i think over like seven thousand members across the globe that are just like latinx latinos hispanics that are in tech and we're all coming together and sharing like job postings conferences where the best pupusas are in like all random cities and like being there for each other. And I think if you don't have a network of other Latinos and Hispanics in tech, Tequeria is a good starting point. And the other organization that I work closely with and that I love is Code 2040. Code 2040 has a mission to bring more underrepresented talent to tech companies, but they're based out of Silicon Valley. And Code 2040 name comes from the, the, the metric that in 2040, Hispanic and Latinos are going to be the majority of the population in the US. So they have programs, if you're a high school student, if you're in college, for you to get some help getting landing that interview for you to get the job, the apprenticeship, and, and things like that, plus a whole bunch of resources on how to be a better ally to Black and Latinx people on, on so many sorts of levels. So there's resources out there and there's communities that you should be part of in order to get the connections to get your next job if you're looking to make the move. That is such amazing information. And I, after this, I would love if you could share some in the comments. Um, I know we have a lot of students on here. We typically get students from some local universities and a lot of Latinas and Latinos. So that is amazing information. And I think you are just the perfect example of going through that whole process and making those connections. So anyone who wants to connect with Anna, um, I put some things over in the comments and I wanted to let you guys know if you have any questions, we do have a few minutes to go through questions. Um, let's check out the comments now. Mm -mm -mm. All right, we have one from Richard. 
Hi, what's the best piece of advice that you could offer disadvantaged and underestimated people in America who want to improve their lives? I think we touched about it earlier, but I, I would say that framing your underrepresentation and for folks that have disabilities as like things that you bring to the table that other people don't is actually really, really amazing. Um, I think one of the other things is that you have to embrace that you belong in the space because if not, you have a little less passion of on moving forward, in, in my opinion. So making sure that you can envision yourself and the jobs that you're applying into the America that you want. And with that is also like seeking community because I think any individual can do amazing work, but if it's not advocated and announced constantly, you're you're just another number in the tech space. So you kind of do need a little bit of a network to amplify your voice. So making sure that you join communities that are able to support you. And then of course you have to continue sharing your story because at that moment you're now having a space and you have to make it better for the next person that's gonna come after us. That's exactly right. And I think that you do an amazing job of that. We thank you so much for being here. Are there, is there anything that you want to add to your story that maybe we didn't talk about? Like maybe the outcome of the lawsuit might be a good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we settled the, the lawsuit publicly. If anyone's interested, I think the best website to go is fairpayforengineers.com. Um, my lawyers were Otter and Golden. Jahan was the main lawyer. We are, we actually settled in November of 2018. It got signed by the California court. The class uh, ended up being 488 engineers. We settled on $10 million that would cover uh, everyone and like lawyers, of course, take their, their chunk out of it. And then the money that was left for the lawsuit ended up being classified into two funds. So we had one fund for wages where it was very much based on equal pay of what what equity did you not get because you were underrepresented and what pay did you not get during your tenure at the organizations that they were they had to kind of like pay back so a big portion of the money went to that and another portion of the lawsuit fund was very much of opting in so people in the in the group of the class they had to submit responses to questions and talk about their experience and post evidence of like harassment discrimination hostile environment um, medical stuff, like whatever it was that you felt that you deserved money from, you had to bring that to the table. Like it was a really hard ask and going through that was, was rough for me. Um, and we, we were able to have like these two, two funds that felt like was needed. Um, and I think one of the best things of the lawsuit, like two things out of the lawsuit is like, I didn't want a non-disclosure agreement. I wanted to share my story. As you can tell, like, I'm proud of like my wounds and like my wins and rubbing salt on them is going to suck. But at the same time, it's like, I get to share things that not everyone feels comfortable doing so. And it's just part of my personality. So I love doing that. And the other thing that came out of the lawsuit, which you can read more online about, is that we put systematic things in place in order to make Uber a better workplace. So yes, I was really angry and uh, like things were really rough for me, but I still had hope that the organization can seek change. And that's everything that I always strive for when I was there. So we we put some policies in place that the lawyers were gonna work with Uber for the upcoming three years. And we were gonna do check-ins every six months. And it was around making sure that any underrepresented engineer that joined the organization would get mentorship from day one, that they would get check-ins every like 30, 60 days based on, on performance of like, how are you doing now based on getting promoted or like your current engineering level? And what would you be missing if you're not hitting a certain milestone that they need to tell you, like they should tell you up front, um, as well as making sure, like one of the other things that was really important was that anyone that was contributing to diversity and inclusion and equity initiatives at Uber 
was to actually get recognition in form of payment. So bonuses were going to get tied to involvement in ARGs and DNI work, which is not common in any organization or company. So we were trying to look for things that we are able to use as a model for later lawsuits for for making technology space better for any minority. And there's a few whole bunch of other recommendations that we put in that Uber started implementing. We had a check in a few months ago with the lawyers on it, which was really cool to to see because it's like the fruits of my lawsuit and and all my sorrows. And I, I think it's, it's really awesome that all of this information is public where other companies can learn what they can do better to make their workspace, workspace better today versus waiting for things to kind of blow up. So I love that we ended on this because I think that this really is the theme that ties everything that we talked about together. You took something that was an you know, could potentially be seen as a negative and a disadvantage. And you fought that, you kept going forward and you turned it into an advantage, not only for yourself, but for the people around you and for the future. And I think that that encapsulates who you are, what you stand for and what you're doing in the world. And we thank you for it so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me and anyone that wants to stay in touch with me will be posting information on, on ways to, to stay in touch. Um, I'm easy to find on the internet too. There's not that many Ana Margarita Medinas that are out in, in Silicon Valley. Um, and I do a lot of public speaking. So you also can look me up on YouTube or Spotify and you'll see talks and podcasts. I, I want to just say we, we do have some things in the comments and I was getting a ton of text messages, guys. I'm not ignoring you, but everyone just saying how inspirational your story is and how today was just meant to be with the cancellation. And this is really what a lot of people need to hear. So many people are in a low place with COVID and losing their jobs that these are the inspirational stories we need. This is the support that we need to give each other and keep moving forward together. Um, so thank you again. Um, I hope that everyone connects with Anna. She also does speaking gigs. So if you guys need someone for anything, please check out her site. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Stay in touch. Stay safe. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in again. I know there are people who have been here every week. We hope to be bringing you more and more inspirational stories. Um, if you have any suggestions for speakers or you want to be a speaker, feel free to let us know at chamber at pmahcc.org. The Latino Pittsburgh Digital Speaker Series is an initiative of the Pittsburgh Metropolitan Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Its goals are to share relevant information, inspire growth, and foster opportunity. Speakers include community leaders and members, as well as other individuals who have a positive impact, not only on the Hispanic community, but the region at large. Next week on Tuesday from 12 to 1, we will be speaking with Joe Eliza. He is the founder and CEO of the CE Leadership Group. They actually do a lot of the federal trainings in the area. He does leadership training, um, small business growth training. He's on the board for the chamber. And I know that he has a ton of awesome information to bring to the table. So we hope to see you next week. Um, if you guys want more information about the chamber, feel free to visit W www.pmahcc.org. Thank you for tuning in and I hope to see you next week. Adios.